Do you know how many degrees of rotation the Earth rotates per hour? So what are the time zones in the US? What is dead reckoning? So you always have to think, if something happens, do I have a place to go? Do you remember the different types of speeds that we have? <laughs> All 20 of them. Today, we're going to be diving into navigation and, you know, kind of everything that goes with navigation. If the power plant fails, you cause no undue hazard to persons or property on the ground. We use a time that's the same for everyone. What's that called? Great question. True North remains in the same place. Magnetic North moves. I have an amazing way to remember which way to go, but it's in French. <laughs> And welcome back to another episode of The Flying New Guy, where we cover aviation topics that you need to know to earn your pilot certificate. And as always, Jason is with us. Welcome back. Thank you. Today, we're going to be diving into navigation and, you know, kind of everything that goes with navigation. Uh, it's a complex topic, obviously, that covers time zones, winds, ground navigation, VFR regulation, magnetic deviation, all the good stuff. So there's a lot to unpack. So let's get that started. Well, Jason, let's start with uh, something that confuses people all the time, time zones. Uh, we use a time that's the same for everyone. What's that called? UTC. UTC. Or Zulu time. Which stands for, what does UTC stand for? Universal coordinated UTC. I don't know. I'm like universal coordinated time, but it's that's UCT, so. Universal time coordinated? Yeah, it is definitely. <laughs> it's the coordinated universal time, C-U-T. <laughs> so... But yeah, those are the letters. You put them in whatever order you want. And then we have to convert to, to local time. Now, mm -hmm. where is it confusing to people? Because we have multiple time zones here. Yeah. And, and then daylight savings time. Yes. And then Arizona doesn't follow daylight and savings then, time. And it's even more complicated in, in Arizona, yes. I, I Although it's, it's not. <laughs> I think it's less complicated. Does UTC change time? No. Okay. It's always the same. That's why, it's, yeah. that's why it gets confusing. Uh, there are some countries that don't change time, by the way. And there are some countries that don't have time zones as well, even big countries. China, so, I think, is one of them. That's China is the best example. One time zone for one the, whole, zone. the whole thing. Do you know how many degrees of rotation the Earth rotates per hour? I mean, it's easy math. Uh, what is it, 15? Yeah, 15. Oh, that was quick math. That was good. So what are the time zones in the U.S.? We have Eastern time, Central time, Mountain time, Pacific time. Pacific. Right now in Arizona, we are in... Well, are we always in or we're always in always in standard time in mountain standard time. mountain MST. standard. Yes. But, but right now, technically, we, we are match in, Pacific. We're also in Pacific uh, daylight, daylight saving time for a few more months for for another month, I think, mm -hmm. before it changes. Okay. So here's a scenario. <laughs> You're going to depart and, and we're not trying to get you confused, folks. It's just a, kind of a kind of the joke that we have to adapt, even though. You can't tell people MST because if you tell people MST, they don't know what it is. We're in, I always tell people we're in Pacific right now and then we're going to be in mountain time pretty soon. Yep. So we have an airplane that departs from the Eastern okay. time zone, okay, 9.45 in the morning. And they're going to do a two hour flight to a, a, a location in the central time zone. Okay. okay? Uh, this is all in daylight time. At what time are they going to land? How would you solve this? Let's say you, you had that question from a, from a logical perspective. I would, looking for I would convert to UTC. I would convert and to then UTC. Do whatever addition, subtraction needs to be done. And yeah. then. Yeah. So that, that, that thing is pretty simple, right? 945, you convert that to, that's the departure time. You convert that to UTC. You add the length of the flight time. Mm -hmm. And then you have your answer in UTC. Right. I see people doing it different ways. They try to convert to local time and then they add two hours and then. They try to convert to the airport, uh, the arrival airport, and then they convert to UTC. I think that's too much work. Just go straight to whatever the answer is. Eastern time, do you know what the, the time factor is? Eastern time is minus four right now. It will be minus five in a month or so. Yep. Yep. So you would be departing at 945 plus four and then adding two hours. Yes. So that would be 945 plus four. It's 1300 13. plus another two. Yep. 1545 would be your arrival in UTC. That's really it about the time zones. You have to learn them. You have to kind of know which state is in one time zone. But obviously, if you don't know, you're going to an airport and you're not sure because you're not from that area and you're not sure if it's Eastern or if it's, if it's Central, how would you know? I would look up the chart supplement. Yeah, chart supplement will tell you. It will even tell you the actual UTC conversion for mm -hmm. each of those. So yeah, it's, that's the easiest way to do it. Okay, pilotage and dead reckoning. So once we're up in the air, we're going to have to figure out where we are. 
That's especially true if the GPS fails. These days with GPS, it's pretty easy to get a good idea of where you are in, in flight. But we're still going to be using pilotage and dead reckoning. What is dead reckoning? It is <laughs> time distance. Yep. Basically. Yep. I always say using math, mm -hmm. right, to do to do your calculation. What do we call it? Dead reckoning. It's deduced reckon yeah. reckoning, but D E D or D E A D. Some people, yeah, most people say write it D E A D, which we do as well. But technically, it would be better if we write it D E D. I think it would confuse people less about what it actually means. What's pilotage, on the other hand, using landmarks to identify where you're at, navigating visually, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one is like you're driving your car and then you're just looking at the signs in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And the other one, you pull up a map and then you start to do calculations and to plot your stuff. When we are in flight, there's going to be a, an airspeed that's going to be very important when we do all of this navigation stuff. Which airspeed is it? Which type of speed is it? Do you remember the different types of speeds that we have? <laughs> like all 20 of them? All 20 of them? <laughs> there's not that many. What's the acronym for remembering your airspeed? Oh, I oh. Ice, ice T. T. Yeah. Ice. So I. Indicated. Indicated. Calibrated. C, calibrated. Uh, that one is tough. E is equivalent. Equivalent. It, it doesn't apply to us, but. And then true. And then true. And then there is another one that's not in the acronym, which <laughs> is the one I'm looking for. <laughs> which one is it? Um, I mean, is it ground speed? Yeah, ground speed. Okay. Yeah, ground speed. Why is, why is ground speed important? Well, is ground speed an airspeed? It's your airspeed over the ground, <laughs> right? It's ground speed, right? It's ground speed, yeah. Ground speed is, I mean, it's how long it's going to take you to get from A to B. Yeah. It's the actual speed of the aircraft over, over the, the ground. ground. Okay. Yeah. What affects it? Wind. Wind. Okay. And the wind is going to affect a couple more things as well. When we fly, what is it going to affect? So our, the speed at which we go over the ground mm -hmm. and then what else? Heading. The heading. Okay. What's the definition of a heading? the direction the nose of the airplane is pointing. Okay. As opposed to what? Course. Oh, course. Okay. Course is what? The direction the airplane is actually flying over the ground. Yes. And the difference between those two? I don't remember. <laughs> well, that's your wind correction angle. Okay. Yeah. Right? Yep. That makes total sense. Yeah. Because the wind is affecting it. So that's mm -hmm. your wind correction angle. So to go from a course to a heading, we're going to apply the wind correction angle. We have to correct for the wind. There's another thing that we have to correct for when we're doing these cross country. What is it? No, uh, true north versus magnetic. True north versus magnetic. Okay. What is that called? What's the difference between those two? Variation. Variation. Okay. Why do we have two different norths? Because the magnetic fields around the earth are changing constantly. Okay. And so yeah. the true north remains in the same place. Magnetic north moves. So as it moves, our compass is going to read different why do we care about the magnetic north? That's what we're using to navigate. That's what our airplane instruments are using to navigate. Right. So then why do we care about the true north? Great question. <laughs> we do. There's a reason why we care about the true north. What do we have as a tool that is available that has the true north as a reference? I mean, the charts yeah. do, but they also have, they have both, right? Well, not really. They give you your variation, variation so you can modify the information from the map. That's the reason you're getting variation is to go from the map. So the map is always giving you true, true north, north yeah. because that's the way the maps are designed. It would be impossible yeah. to create maps that are oriented based on magnetic. If we had an instrument in the airplane that could orient us based on true north, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't need variation. But because the only instrument that we have available is using the magnetic field, which in today's age, we really technically wouldn't even need all of that, right? Right. But because of the magnetic compass, that's really the, the, the principal issue here. Then we need a way to convert between the two. So that's why you have those lines available. But yeah, the, the reason why we care about those two is because one tool has one and then the other tool in the airplane uses a different reference. Mm -hmm. So we have to kind of combine the two and that's what the charts do. So. There's another term, variation. It almost kind of sounds like it. It ends the same way with Asian. <laughs> what's, what's the other term? So we, we correct for the wind, we correct for variation, and we have another one that's kind of created in the airplane yeah, itself. Yeah, it starts with a D. Yep. Deviation. D. So deviation, what is that? Other electric fields are created and magnetic fields created inside the airplane. 
Yeah. What's a big source of deviation in the airplane? The engine. Yeah, the engine. And because the propeller, it's a, yeah. It's a spinning piece of metal, metal. <laughs> that is going to create yeah, a magnetic field. How do we f- correct for that one? If, if I remember correctly, that one is corrected for in the heading indicator? No. No? Is it corrected for at all? It depends on the airplane. Okay. So in, in a traditional airplane, there's going to be a, a deviation card that is oh, going okay. to tell you what it is. Actually, on it, 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 all airplanes, the one you're thinking about is the G1000 fixes the variation mm-hmm. in, in the system. But in this case, no, you have a deviation card because each airplane is specific. So they do testing over time. Every once in a while, they run the deviation card and they'll tell you if you're on a heading of north, then you need to fly zero, uh, three, five, nine. So that's a one degree of deviation. If you're on a heading of zero, three, zero, and it gives you every 30 degrees. Mm Mm-hmm. And so when you get in the airplane, that's kind of the last thing that you do when you have a paper chart, you go in there and then you fill out your deviation. It's usually only a couple degrees, like a degree or two. I've never seen it much more than that. But you do have to take that into account because one degree or two degrees over time will get you, of course. Mm-hmm. So there's this saying that, that we hear, um, which is east is least and west is best. What does that refer to? That is correcting magnetic to true. What does that mean? East is least. So you subtract east variation at west variation. Yep. So what is the difference between a magnetic heading and a magnetic course? One is where the airplane is facing. The other is the course across the ground according to the magnetic compass. Yeah. What's the name of that value that's the difference between the magnetic heading and the magnetic course? Wind correction angle? Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a trick question, Yeah, but as soon as you start introducing the word magnetic, people get confused, right? What's the difference between a true heading and a true course? Still wind correction angle? Yes, still wind correction. Absolutely. That, again, trick question, but that shows the understanding that, you know, mm-hmm. course to heading is... Is that. wind correction angle. What if I say, what's the difference between a true course and a magnetic course? That's variation. Yeah. What's the difference between a true heading and a magnetic heading. Also variation. Also the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to listen to these terms because some people go from a true course map Mm -hmm. to a true heading, okay, airplane language. Mm -hmm. And then from the true heading, they go to magnetic heading. And some people do it the other way around. They go from true to magnetic. And then from here, they go from a course to a heading. So there's no right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. What value do you really care about when you get in the airplane to do your cross country. Magnetic heading. Magnetic heading, yes. That, that's what you're gonna be mm-hmm. doing. And then technically that magnetic heading, you still have to convert that because of the deviation, deviation. right? Yep. But the magnetic heading is really what you care about. How you get there, you've got two different ways. You get an intermediary step to do it, mm-hmm. which is you have to correct for the wind and then correct for variation. Or you correct for variation first, and then you correct for the wind. The end result is the same. It doesn't matter how you do it. Some schools do it one way. Some schools do it the other way. So there's, again, not a right or wrong way to do it. Those discussions are important. You need to know why you're correcting for this, how you're correcting it, and then at the end of the day, what is the value? So the compass heading is technically the last thing that you want, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's converted for that deviation Deviation. in the airplane. So compass CH, compass heading, is technically the, the final term that you need. Okay. Let's talk about altitudes that we're going to fly at. Uh, can we fly that cross country at any altitude that we want? No. No? <laughs> I mean, yes, but no. But you should Right? <laughs> yeah. You can, but you shouldn't. Yep. What's the rule? For flights that are headed, is it one degree to 180 degrees? So east, Almost. essentially? Zero to 179. <laughs> so yeah. Zero to 179. Yep. You start at zero to 179. Um, so headed east are odd thousand plus 500. Yep. So that's 180 to 359 mm-hmm. are even thousand plus 500. Yep. Why do we add the 500? Because the others are for instrument flights. Mm-hmm. I have an amazing way to remember which way to go, but it's in French. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to know French geography. Because France is right here, and then Italy is to the east, and then Spain is to the west. But Italy starts with an I, and Mm -hmm. the word for odd numbers in French starts with an I. So when you're going towards Italy, it's odd numbers, 
And then Spain start is Espagne and French starts with an E and E is the same for Eve anyway. So <laughs> you have to know French and where French is to remember that one. So don't do it. And now I'm going to remember it. And now you're going to remember <laughs> it. Yeah. It's towards Italy. So Ampère. Ampère is odd in French and starts with an I. Altitude and fuel requirements. Go ahead and talk about this. What's the minimum safe altitude for any location that we're going to be flying? Do you want me to quote the regs here? Yeah, or? yeah the regs. What does it say? Uh, at an altitude where if the power plant fails, you cause no undue hazard to persons or property on the ground. Pretty much. That's it. So we're going to have to think about that when we fly. Now, there's obviously another thing that you have to think about when you fly is, and you've flown with me before when we've gone on mm -hmm. terrain that's less than hospitable <laughs> when you fly over, right? So you always have to think if something happens, do I have a place to go? Yeah. Uh, but when you're flying where we are flying at higher elevation already because of the terrain, you can only go so high above the terrain yeah. itself. So in Florida, when we did cross country, we'd go five or 6,000 feet AGL above the ground, which was also MSL. Mm -hmm. But here, 5,000 feet, sometimes you're flying over Colorado where the base terrain is at nine or 10,000 10. feet. You can't really go that high if you don't have the proper equipment and if you don't have the proper, you know, um, oxygen and everything. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about those things when you start flying, you know, you're gliding distance. Uh, there's a tool in for flight that you can turn on that will kind of give you the the distance, how far you can go. I look at that quite often. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in situations where I'm like, if my engine fails right now, I've got really nowhere to go. I can glide for a while, but even gliding, I don't have a good place. So you, you got to think about those things as you're planning your cross country. You know, I remember flying over Utah and it was just stacks of rocks mm -hmm. piled on top of each other and you look around and you say yeah i can't there's nothing i can I, go i remember that from yeah. our trip to colorado mm -hmm. that that one area where it was like where would you go like well i'm gonna aim for one of the grassy areas in the mountains but that's that's all you that's have. all you can yeah. do yeah and sometimes you're only a few thousand feet above the ground i try never to go below a thousand feet above the ground uh when we fly over passes and things like that but yeah it's not not always easy mm -hmm. so just something to keep in mind we're going to have to make sure we have enough fuel on board the aircraft. How much fuel are you going to take? Way more than I need. Yeah. But I think the regs say 30 minutes for day VFR and 45 for night. Yeah. So that's the bare minimum. At every flight school I manage, we double that up pretty much. I, I think that's uh, yeah. good. <laughs> and then as a personal minimum, one hour, you know, with mm -hmm. landing. Obviously, if I'm doing a diversion, then I have that fuel available and I'm going to land p possibly closer to that 30 minutes mm -hmm. than, than I, I would normally. But that's why you have it. That's why you bring it with you. So, yeah. yeah, 30 minutes and 45 at night. Absolutely. All right, folks, you get it. That covers pretty much the basic for this episode. Uh, we're not done yet. There's going to be a part two where we're going to explore ground navigations, VOR, GPS, and then also how to file a flight plan, which is kind of important. All of this information and everything else that you need to know to become a private pilot is available in our Private Pilot Made Easy course. It is extremely in-depth, as uh, Jason can attest, because he went through the uh, entire course as well. You can click the link below to check it out. And uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you in the next one.